You're listening to Choose FI Radio. The blueprint for financial independence lives here. If you're looking to unlock the secrets to financial independence and early retirement, you're in the right place. Stay tuned and join a community of like-minded people who are getting off the hamster wheel and taking control of their lives in the pursuit of financial independence. Choose FI, your home for financial independence online. Hey guys, welcome to the Choose FI radio podcast. Today we're going to be speaking with Travis Shakespeare, who's working with Scott Rickens to produce and direct the FI documentary that's going to be released at the end of this year, beginning of next. What makes this really interesting is that Travis is actually an executive at a major media company in Hollywood. He's someone that's been embedded in the FI community for several years now. I know he's gone to at least one Chautauqua. And he's someone that cares deeply about the ideas that this community is so passionate about. So Travis is going to be working with Scott as the director of the documentary. And this is absolutely perfect because Travis in Hollywood is most known for his work as a showrunner, which is another way of saying a director of a TV show, taking a concept from zero to 100. His body of work includes Life Below Zero, which was featured on National Geographic, Deadliest Catch, and Ice Road Truckers. The shows he's worked on have been nominated multiple times and actually won several Emmys. One of the shows he worked on was actually nominated for the James Beard Award. Now, I had to go look that up, but it's basically Hollywood speak for the Oscars of the food world. So... This is just a fantastic opportunity. We've been telling you from the beginning that Phi, which has in the past been considered a subculture, is on the verge of a mainstream breakthrough. And Travis partnering with Scott on this documentary tells me that it's right there on this hockey stick trajectory. Super excited to get a chance to have this conversation. And to help me with this, I have my co-host Brad here with me today. How you doing, buddy? I am doing quite well, Jonathan. This is a real treat for us and for the audience as well. We had the good fortune of meeting Travis at FinCon this past October and where him and Scott and the crew were filming for Playing With Fire and just an absolutely great guy. I wound up subsequently chatting with him on the phone for a couple hours and really got to know him. And I am really excited to bring Travis to the FI community here on, on the podcast. So with that, Travis, welcome to the show. Brad Jonathan, thank you very much. It's an honor to be here. So Travis, I feel like there's so many different places that we could start, but I think from our perspective, I would love to hear what drew you to the media industry and how you actually ended up in the role that you're in currently with this major media company in Hollywood. You know, I was always interested in storytelling. I mean, like most kids, I went to the movies and I fell in love with Star Wars. (laughs) That was probably like the thing that got me started. And I just looked up on the screen as a kid and I thought, that's what I want to do someday. I want to bring this kind of entertainment and the joy that I feel watching and consuming media to other people. That was basically how it all started. I was an actor for many, many years. I trained in New York City, moved out to LA. I pursued an acting career for probably about two decades before I ended up getting involved in television production. Around the mid-90s, I had been working as, well, trying to pursue an acting career, and I had some success, mostly failure, and one day a friend called and asked if I wanted to work on a TV show. I said, yes, I would, and I started working in production. That path led me to working on shows like Ice Road Truckers, Deadliest Catch. Over the years, I sort of built up my resume and became a showrunner, which is essentially the director of a television series. And about six years ago, I got a call to run a series called Life Below Zero on National Geographic Channel. That show did really, really well. And the company that I worked for invited me to become an executive for the first time in my life, which was really unexpected. I never really tried to go the corporate route. I think I always sort of considered myself to be more of an artist than a corporate kind of guy, but life takes us on all kinds of twists and turns. And I ended up uh, sort of now overseeing the unscripted division of BBC Worldwide in Los Angeles. So 
it's a big corporate job. Um, it's been a really interesting shift for me personally to to do that. But it's a great company, and uh, it offers me a lot of opportunities that um, I may not have otherwise had as a freelancer. What I love about having this conversation with you, Travis, is your background tells me that you're someone that deeply cares about building a story. I mean, your entire career has has been built around that idea. And to know that you're partnering with Scott on this documentary, I'd love to hear your perspective on the power of telling a story through the medium of film. You know, story is central to the human existence, right? The stories that we tell ourselves have the power to shape our world. For instance, you can tell yourself the story of a world with uh, never-ending war, or you can tell yourself the story of let's go to the moon. And human beings have the unique capacity to be able to transform their story into reality. That's what we do on a daily basis. I mean, if you look at yourself driving down the street on your way to work in the morning, you can sit there and tell yourself the story of how there are so many cars on the road and everybody's in your way and it will create an emotional state in you that sort of destroys your day. Or you can put on Shoes FI, get in the car and be inspired by the stories that you hear coming from a podcast. And that's going to shape the way that you then create your world. The thing about film as opposed to probably podcasts specifically and or blogs is that film and television are really special in that they combine the mediums of music, picture, and words into a medium that has a unique ability to transport us into a deep emotional state. So a lot of the blogs and a lot of the podcasts, which I absolutely love and I consume myself, are very how-to, right? The thing about making a documentary about the FI community is that I really believe it's going to allow us to create a call to action that speaks to people emotionally and puts in front of people the very real possibility that a person can transform his or her life on using the tools that the FI community offers, I completely agree, Travis. And what strikes me is with, especially with some of the, the titles that we mentioned on your credits earlier, you have a background of highlighting subcultures. And, and I'd love to hear your take on what your perception was of the Phi community before you realized the power of it yourself. What was it like to discover Phi and see this subculture as an outsider? And how has that shifted over the last, I don't know, several years? Wow, that's a big question. Let me start by just telling you my story of how I got to Phi. I struggled as an actor, and I was a very good starving artist for many, many years, which probably helped me transition into the world of Phi more easily than some other people might, might have. I struggled financially for the better part of my life, and I was in a great deal of debt up until the time I turned 40. When I turned 40, my dad passed away. He was a school teacher, and he was a pretty frugal guy. I mean, I think more out of necessity in trying to raise a family of four on a school teacher's salary than anything. You know, he died and he had a teacher's pension that my mom got. And he also had $150,000 in investments that me and my sister split. So at age 40, I was still $40,000 in student loan debt. I was paying 9% interest because at the time that I consolidated my loans, I was told that 9% was the lowest interest rate I would ever see in my lifetime, so it was fixed. And I was sitting there at 40 years old with $40,000 in debt, and I got my big windfall, right? The big inheritance that we all kind of someday think we might get, I think, in American culture. It's kind of part of our lottery mentality. I was $40,000 in debt, and I had $75,000 to play with. So I paid off my $40,000 in student loan debt and also the outstanding credit card debt that I had because I was never really good with money. You know, Nobody ever really taught me how to be financially literate. And I had always just believed that my career would somehow take off in a way that I would suddenly become famous and rich overnight. Again, that goes back to the American kind of lottery mentality that I think a lot of people have in this country um, and that exacerbates our ignorance about financial literacy. At any rate, I paid off my student loan debt. I paid my sister 
half of the value of my dad's Honda Civic, which was a 2005 Honda Civic. The value of that was about $13,000. And for the first time in my life, I had about $30,000 in the black. And I panicked because I didn't have the first idea what to do with that money. So I got on Amazon and I started Googling books and I got a copy of William Bernstein's The Intelligent Investor. And, you know, I came up through storytelling and theater and film and I was not a math guy. And I sat there and tried to read The Intelligent Investor and it was just a total torture for me because it was so complicated (laughs) that I had no idea how to even ingest the information. But I pushed myself through it. I knew that on some level, coming into a tiny amount of money at such a late time in life, that I needed to educate myself and create a new future because all of my dreams of just hitting it big overnight were clearly not coming to pass. So I needed to find a new way. I kept doing research and along the way I came across, well, you know, the world of blogs kind of became popular about three or four years into my journey to educate myself in financial literacy. And I came across, I think actually early retirement extreme and get rich slowly first, or at the right at the same time, Mr. Money Mustache. I really liked get rich slowly because uh, JD Roth, who is the author, was somebody who reminded me of myself, who was sort of not totally up on how to do all this stuff and trying to figure it out. And he taught me a lot about debt, right? And how credit cards work and how they're basically preying upon our goodwill as consumers in a way that often entraps or enslaves us to the bank, which then in turn enslaves us to a career that we may or may not necessarily want to be pursuing Uh, for, you know, as we all know, 30 or 40 years, if we're lucky. So I came across uh, Get Rich Slowly, and probably Mr. Money Mustache's The Shockingly Simple Math Behind Early Retirement, and something really started ringing in my head. I was like, this is the thing that I've been looking for. Then I read uh, Early Retirement Extreme by Jacob Lund Fisk, which is an incredible, incredible book. All the while, I started thinking about all of these people as a kind of subculture. It just, you know, my storyteller's eye started looking at all of these people and I thought, you know, these are people who are doing something really quite radical. I produced a TV show called Life Below Zero, which features people who are in a way the original FIers who have given up a life of normalcy to pursue radical independence. Um, These are people who have left their homes, some of them have left their families, and they have struck out on their own in the Alaskan wilderness to be their own man or their own woman. It's sort of the ultimate in FU money, right? Just to walk away from society and turn your back on the standard narrative. I call the standard narrative that sort of cubicle to garage life of going to school, getting in debt, taking on a mortgage, having some kids, working until you're 40, and then if you're lucky, retire for 10 years of health, if you're lucky, and then, you know, slowly succumb to decay and death. That's not a very pretty picture, I know, but... It's just one way of telling yourself the story. It is just one way of telling (laughs) yourself the story. (laughs) That's absolutely true. Another way of telling yourself the story is... I don't need to be enslaved to a system that is designed wholly to enslave me. Travis, I'm curious about that aha moment when it came to the FI community. Do you think that it was truly this ability to see that story and to see this subculture? Or was it when you read Mr. Money Mustache's The Shockingly Simple Post, was it more of like a a mathematical? I know you said you weren't a a mathematical mind, but you had been on this three-year journey to educate yourself. And also, I'm somewhat curious what that looked like. But do you think that it was more of a, this is the summation of what I'd learned on my education journey? Or it was the really the storytelling side of you that that made you jump into the Phi community? 
I think that I always lead with the storytelling uh, just as a person. Like you said, I'm not a math mind. I don't proclaim to be one. I still don't really understand the bond market. <laughs> so if you guys could help me, that would be great. 100% I, VTSAX. <laughs> exactly. exactly. Uh, um, kidding, people. Kidding. It was humor. Uh, no, you know, I really do think it was the storytelling. I mean, Jacob Lund Fisk is, for me, the story that got me hooked in first. And that's because Jacob Fisk did something that was truly radical. I mean, when I was reading his book, I was like, this guy is basically living like a homeless person, right? I mean, he was living on something like, what, $7,000 a year? Yeah, that's what I said. And, and he was doing it because he was working in opposition to the primary force of our society, which is a consumer message that tries to loop all of us in to its web, right? I mean, Americans are, are educated to become consumers. If you look at our school system, for example, there's very little financial literacy. I mean, I don't even think they taught me how to balance a checkbook when I went to school. But I knew how to buy things and I knew how to get into debt like that. Like I was already an expert by the time I was a teenager, because that's what our culture taught us. And somehow Jacob Lund Fisk and the rest of the FI community sort of sensed that and decided to go up against it. The great thing about the community as a subculture is that it's a bunch of brainiacs for the most part, right? It is a bunch of engineers and math nerds and computer programmers who are experts at hacking the system. So when I heard the story of Jacob, you know, sort of almost living like a homeless person in I guess, a kind of protest against the normal system that we're all handed at birth in the developed world. I thought, this is an extraordinary individual. And he reminded me of the people that I've featured on my television shows who've left everything to go pursue a life of freedom in Alaska in the vast wilderness, right? So that's really where the story came in. And then when I heard, when I got to Mr. Money Mustache, or concurrently, you know, Pete's story is, is very similar, and he tells it with such great humor, and he is such a great character. You know, he even modeled a caricature of himself by calling himself Mr. Money Mustache and photographing himself like putting wax on his mustache. You know, I thought that was brilliant, just as a, from a character standpoint. So he's got the best of both worlds in that. He's both a nerd and a great storyteller. I love that you latched onto this, but I'm captivated by this. And it strikes me that you're noticing what a compelling story this is. I mean, you're, you're, you see this contrarian aspect to these different people that you've mentioned and how they're going against the system and they're finding this slightly more optimized lane. But Jacob Lund Fisker is extreme. By any standard, he is extreme. It's almost like cleansing the palate, going to zero and then adding back slowly. And he encourages you not to add back, you know, just have one plate, one fork, anything else adds complexity and, and is unnecessary. I, I'm actually a little bit surprised that you were able that, that your next step was to take action, because if that was your introduction to the Phi community, it is so extreme and it can be difficult to relate to. I'm curious on your take on that, because I know that you you embrace the FI community at this point, right? I absolutely embrace it. Listen, the FI community is really a subculture of radicals, in my opinion. I mean, I don't mean that in a negative way. The subculture of the FI community is, in my mind, a very American enterprise, okay? There's a thematic root in what's happening in the FI community that I see going all the way back to something like Walden, right? Henry David Thoreau's classic book about a guy who rejects the complexity of life in order to simplify and create a space for himself to understand what's truly important in the world. And I really do see the Phi community as a reflection of that kind of American value. It kind of goes back in a way to a Puritan ethos, you might say, but it also has a glorious entrepreneurial edge to it. So the American ethos has two competing 
feelings inside of it. On the one hand, you have this puritanical stripping away back to nature, back to God kind of like drive that probably drove us into our manifest destiny. And on the other hand, you have this incredible, creative, entrepreneurial spirit that has driven our country into something that the world has never seen before as an experiment. The Phi community somehow combines both of those threads and, in my eyes, is creating a subculture that is at once subversive and, at the same time, a complete inspiration because it points us in a direction that I think we are only beginning to really see. And what I'll say about that is this. The people who have broken themselves free from the standard narrative and who have begun to understand that another world is possible through wealth are in some ways a precursor to what I see happening to us as a society once we get into a robot-driven world. You know, there's going to come a time when human beings are mechanically less useful. It's happening more and more every day. And the Phi community is sort of a grand experiment, if you will, in what it's like to liberate yourself from the drudgery of the 20th century nine to five kind of narrative. What happens when you have enough money to break yourself free and pursue a life driven by your own values as opposed to the values of a culture that were handed to you at birth? What does that mean? What are you capable of? What we see over and over again in the Phi community is that the American spirit of entrepreneurship sort of comes to the fore. You have artists, you have writers, you have creators of content like you, Brad and Jonathan. You have um, people building businesses. I mean, you can't take that spark out of us as Americans, right? So that's my grand thesis on you know where this whole thing is going. I love that you called it the grand thesis, Brad. I was literally wanting just to text you or something. Chills down my spine. Awesome. I'm I'm inspired. Yeah. No, that's that's remarkable. And and Travis, I loved the what are you capable of? And in turn, what makes you happy? What do you get out of life? You know, we talk about community here often. These are the themes. To me, FI is much more than just numbers on a page. It's about truly living a life that you've designed. And what does that look like? And and I love hearing that that you feel very similarly. And I'm curious, uh, from a storytelling perspective, where you see the Phi community going from here? I think Jonathan and I here at Choose a Phi have been trying to expand the pie. You know, we're trying to bring this this community, this subculture, as you call it, to other people because we feel it is so transformative. I'm curious, you know, from your perspective as a storyteller, how do you see that working? Do you think this is something that can go mainstream, you know, if you will? Is that plausible? Is that where you see even the documentary taking taking you and taking the FI community? So Scott and I have talked about this at length, and I really want this documentary to be a call to action. It's similar to what you guys have been doing, you know, with your podcast. I think that you... And many of your listeners probably have experienced that when you talk to people who haven't necessarily already found their way to the Phi community and you bring up these ideas, you're kind of usually faced with one of two responses. The first is they cock their head and they're like, huh, do you you see what the Kardashians did yesterday? And you're like, "Okay, this isn't going anywhere. Or their ears prick up and they're like, really, what do you mean? What do you mean there are? 30-year-olds who are retiring with a million dollars and exiting the system. How is that even possible, right? So my hope is for the documentary to become a call to action. And I believe that the subculture started with first silent practitioners. You look at The Millionaire Next Door, for instance, who showcases the stories of all of these sort of what I call silent practitioners, right? practicing frugality, practicing the basics of investment, practicing how to create a life of financial independence for themselves. Then you get mainstream press where like Vicki Robin, for instance, who wrote Your Money or Your Life, publishes a book. Same with The Millionaire Next Door. That press takes it on. 
Then you have the blogosphere, which came forward. The blogs are really what drove, I think, this movement forward. Then the podcast came, and now the documentary. So it's just basically leveling up as it gets closer to mainstream. And like you said, I really believe that we're on the cusp of this subculture becoming mainstream. I think more and more people are hearing about it. A lot of people have heard about Mr. Money Mustache, for example. So I do believe that it can go mainstream. There's a lot of energy and a lot of force in our culture that is working against people pursuing the path to financial independence. For a lot of people, it sounds like too much work. They don't want to have to sacrifice. It sounds like, you know, a puritanical path to deprivation. <laughs> you know, it just doesn't sound fun or sexy. I mean, like, it's like me with my own personal path. I had lottery mentality. I thought I was going to strike it rich one day, and suddenly there would just be this big windfall that would fall on my head, and I would suddenly become a millionaire. That's, much, that's a much sexier story than slow, dollar-cost averaging index fund investing. <laughs> that just doesn't sound sexy. So my job as a director is to make that sexy on screen, and it is a challenge, but I'm willing to take it on because I think it's worth it. Travis, do you think the more extreme story from Jacob at ERE and maybe even Pete at Mr. Money Mustache, like, do you think that is a story that can, that can resonate with people at large? Or do you think you need to moderate the, the tone a little bit? Like, how, how do you interpret like, how to bring this to a larger audience? Here's the thing. People are interested in content about extraordinary individuals, right? If you look at anything that's successful in media, it's because it's about something that's extraordinary. And the FI community really is an extraordinary group of people when you, when you really take a, a good, hard look at it. I think that there is, I don't want to say a danger. I would rather say an inspiration in looking at something as extreme as Jacob Lund Fisk, right? The majority of people, including myself, are never going to go down that path because it's just so extreme. But from that extreme path, we can all take inspiration about the graduating degrees of success that are possible. You know, in, to my mind, a successful documentary wouldn't just inspire everybody that watches it to leave their job and create and become a millionaire and, and quit the system. I mean, for a lot of people, just getting $100,000 saved and invested is a could be a point of liberation that could literally change their lives. I mean, one of my favorite posts is Jim Collins' Power of FU Money, right? And I've experienced this in my own life. When I had my first three months of expenses saved, a liberation came over me that I didn't even realize was possible. And then when I had my first year of expenses saved, I mean, that blew my mind. For the first time in my life at like age 42 or 43, I looked at my bank account and I was like, whoa, if I didn't want to, I could like not work for a whole year. <laughs> and I, I really believe that having that power of choice, even in a quote, limited way, which is to say just a year of savings or just three months of savings, changed the course of my life. It allowed me to take greater risks and it allowed me it allowed me to take greater risks in my TV career. You know, I just wasn't as afraid. And I think if a documentary can inspire people to just do that, we would start creating an army of individuals who are challenging the way that the world tells them they have to be in life. I love that. Yeah, and Travis, I absolutely love that quote about becoming an army of, of people who can spread this message and can affect change on our country and on the world. And it reminds me of a, a Margaret Mead quote that I just came across recently, which is, never doubt that a small group of thoughtful, committed citizens can change the world. Indeed, it is the only thing that ever has. Yeah, that was just so powerful to me. And, and it was really a, a perfect, perfect timing to bring it up, you know, in light of what you said about about the FI community. And I think that's why we're constantly talking to people here about spreading this message. Find the people in your lives who 
might be open to the Phi message and send them a Mr. Money Mustache article or send them our podcast on the why of Phi or the pillars of Phi. Get people involved and step outside your comfort zone a little bit and make that change in your friends' lives, your family's lives, and potentially the world. Like, I, I, it sounds grandiose, but but I think it's real. I think that is doable. I think that that's a fantastic quote, and I think that's exactly it. I mean, when I first sort of encountered the, the Phi subculture, and, you know, maybe inspired by the title The Millionaire Next Door, I suddenly wondered what would happen if there was an entire army of millionaires who have liberated themselves from the current narrative? I mean... I don't think it's grandiose to say that this could literally change the world, and it is changing the world. People who have liberated themselves from the financial, the standard financial narrative throughout history have changed the world. These are the people who built railways. These are the people who, sadly, built bombs. These are the people who created universities. I mean, the legacy of financially solvent people is sort of what we've inherited. As we know it right now, the course of humanity is to create greater and greater wealth. And every time there's a new iteration of wealth creation for humanity, we see rapid, incredible change, good and bad. I was following your your storyline of how these different mediums had hits. One of the original ones being The Millionaire Next Door and that just being a book publication and then Vicki Robin getting traction with her book and then getting some media exposure and then now the blogs in place that are capturing people during their downtime and they're always there as a constant free resource available on the internet. Social media is now in place and it's not just the content being written but it's being shared by the followers that were getting benefit from that to the people that are interested in what they recommend. And now you have a podcast that is being able to present this information to people that don't have time or don't have an interest in reading blogs or maybe are looking for a way of getting some form of infotainment, right? Infotainment on their commute to work. And then now this final medium, this final frontier of film, this is a format, this is a medium, this is reaching people that will never listen to a podcast, that will never read a blog, and there's a potential for mass distribution here. And that final chapter, you know, this final iteration, it makes it impossible to ignore this concept. And so when you combine all those mediums that are now in place with a call to action that you can't ignore, it's doing all of us a favor because you're right. I can't, I, even to this point in time, having a podcast and having tens of thousands of people that enjoy listening to the content that Brad and I put together, I cannot walk next door and go to my neighbor and talk to them about this stuff with any real degree of success. But what we found and what our community has found is if they find it on their own, because it's too big to ignore because it's on a major distribution like Netflix or Amazon Prime or it's, you know, it's, it's basically covering the net. They find it. Now those people come back and want to talk to them about this stuff. And it guides them to this content that's been built and polished over the last five to ten years. And it's powerful and it's transformative. That's right. And I think that the ultimate goal for the documentary is to become a, a kind of beacon or a lighthouse that begins – people's journey that will go up like a flare, capture people's attention and encourage and inspire them to take the deep dive that's available through all of the existing media on the subject. So Travis, you know, you've been absorbing this information and you're starting to implement it into your life. At what point do you feel like you want to go from someone that's consuming this information to now you want to take action and be a part of this community and actually repackage it for the people that will be following in your footsteps? You know, that transition probably happened when I went on Chautauqua in Ecuador with Pete from Mr. Money Mustache, Brandon the Mad Scientist, Jim Collins, and Jeremy from Go Curry Cracker. They were sort of my mentors. You know, before I went on Chautauqua, I was looking at the website and I had been reading, you know, the blogs and stuff. And I thought, you know, this is really weird that there's a bunch of rich people going to Ecuador to sit around and talk about money. And I hesitated and I wasn't sure that I wanted to like take that deeper plunge because I just didn't. I think I worried that it was like a direct marketing campaign or something. (laughs) You were Um, going to find the secret hook and they were about to upgrade you into the guru class and you finally figured out what was driving the whole machine, right? 
totally. It was like I thought maybe it was like some offshoot of Scientology that was gonna like get me on like a cruise ship, you know, for a week. I don't know, but I, which would have been I a great story. <laughs> that would have been a great story, but I might not have come back to tell it. You know? <laughs> but you know, I looked at the schedule and I was looking at like the little seminars that they were doing about like each person's you know talk for the week, and the thing that really stood out to me was that one of the days was scheduled just to do community service. And when I saw that there was a day scheduled to do community service, I thought, you know, these guys are up to something much bigger than just money. When I went there and I saw all these people and I met, you know, the main guys and gals of the community, and I was so inspired by their generosity and the fact that they were basically giving away this information, I mean, yeah, we had to pay to go to Ecuador, but it wasn't like a really expensive trip. They weren't making a lot of money off of it. And when you look at the blogs and the podcasts and what you guys are doing, I mean, it's just remarkable that this incredible body of work is just sort of being handed out for free because the people that are involved in it are inspired. I mean, yes, people do make money on their blogs and stuff like that, but I think there's a very pure intention initially that it's an exciting thing that people want to share. So anyways, when I saw that there was a day of service included, it made me realize that this community is up to something much bigger than just money. It was about eight months after my Chautauqua that I reached what I call my first crossover point, which is where I had enough money to pay rent and get the groceries with my passive income. That took me about eight years from the day that I encountered the community to that first crossover point. I emailed Jim and Pete and Brandon and Jeremy. You know, I had to thank them. I was like, I can't believe that the information that you gave me for free has led me to this state of abundance and freedom. I just couldn't believe it worked, you know? <laughs> and there I was staring at my bank account on personal capital or whatever, and I was just, I was just awestruck. Because nothing, I don't know, I just didn't think it would work. I don't, I don't know why. I just, you know, maybe because I'm not an engineer. It seemed like magic. Well, dude, I read that William Bernstein book that you're talking about. It was torture for me too. Total torture. <laughs> okay. So the fact I'm that so it doesn't sorry. have to be complicated is just, it's gratifying. Yeah. And so I emailed them. And from that point forward, I was like, how can I give this back to other people? I started asking myself the service question which is, I think, a natural question that comes once you reach a certain level of wealth. You naturally turn and you think, and you think, well, what am I supposed to do with this money? Like, I have this position of great privilege, even if, you know, I mean, we all work hard. I mean, people in the fire community aren't. The incredible thing is that there are people in this community who reach financial independence on a very middle class salary. I mean, it takes a while. It takes 20 years, probably. But that's an incredible feat in and of itself. But I started asking myself, what can I give back? And, you know, where are my talents in life? And my talents happen to lie in the creation of media, television and, and film. So I emailed them and I said, hey, you guys, if, um, if I were to try to get a documentary together, would you be interested in participating in it? And they were like, absolutely, you know, because they're so generous, these people. And so I started putting together the pieces to make the documentary. Well, I still have a day job and I have a pretty demanding day job. And I was tasked just at the time that I started putting all the preparation together and I got everybody involved and said that they would be happy to do interviews and be participants in the piece. I was tasked to launch uh, a new American version of Top Gear, which became all consuming and basically just destroyed me for the entire year from a work perspective. And I kind of lost sight of the documentary and I was, it was always nagging me and I was, I was kind of bummed about it because I really, really wanted to put it together. But, you know, unlike writing a blog post or uh, recording an hour long podcast, which are not, you know, I'm not saying those aren't difficult. You, you can say it, man. You can just put it right on out there. Okay. But a documentary requires a great deal of, of work and it's also expensive. You can't just make a documentary for like five bucks. <laughs> so yeah. And make a good one, you know, that people will really want to watch. I sort of kind of had lost my way and I started coming out from underneath the production of this show that I was working on. And I heard 
Scott Rickens on your guys' podcast, which I still listen to all the time driving to and fro work, I was like, no way, this guy's like going to do my documentary. <laughs> like I was <laughs> like, oh no, I missed out, you know? <laughs> but I also loved his spirit on your on your episode. And so I thought, you know, I'm just going to email this guy. And all the fates aligned. I emailed him. He emailed me back. He was in Seattle. I happened to be going through Seattle. Uh, we met up and had a meal together, and we told each other our stories, and we just clicked. And I was like, this is the perfect partnership, because one of the things that Scott had sort of undertaken was to document himself and his wife as they go through their first sort of year of the path to five. That was a great storyline to hang the information on. One of the big problems with making a documentary about this community is that it's basically a documentary about a math problem, right? And most people don't want to watch a 90-minute piece about a math problem. So in order to bring in the emotion and the human part of it, it requires a story that's organic, like Scott and Taylor's, to sort of bridge all of the information that uh, we hope to get into the documentary. Obviously, in 90 minutes, we can't tell the whole story of fire, but we're going to do our best to get uh, the basics and um, hopefully some really compelling content as well. Awesome. You know, what strikes me is you never know who's listening to a podcast. You never know who's reading a blog and you never know who's going to see a documentary. And the FI community, it encompasses the entire political spectrum there is the diversity of workforce and diversity of experiences. This is an inclusive tent. And it's amazing to me. I mean, that when you have doctors, lawyers, publishers, trade workers, air traffic controllers, firefighters, you know, you have the entire gambit of people that are pursuing this. When they get organized, anything is possible. It really is. And if you think, it, I mean, I have you, Jonathan and Brad, to thank specifically for this project coming together. And it is really, truly remarkable. And one of the core attributes of the FI community, which is generosity and sharing and community, which is embedded in it. I'll never forget when I came away from my Chautauqua, uh, which was the first time I had like gathered with a group of people who were pursuing FI. And I couldn't believe how happy everybody was and how friendly. I mean, it just blew my mind. Yeah, Travis, I completely agree about that spirit of caring and generosity. And and also when you talked about Scott's energy, I think that's what drew me personally to Scott and why when he called us up literally out of the blue and left a voicemail on our Choose Fi website, I got on the phone with him within a couple of hours. I mean, it was just you could tell he was enthused about this project. He wanted to make it his life's goal, and he just had this infectious energy. Sometimes it's it's hard to explain, but you know, it's in the intervening it's nine months. Charisma. Yeah, charisma. Yeah, that's a good way of putting it. And yeah. really, I mean, Scott and Taylor have become lifelong friends of mine just in the last nine months, and it's it's amazing to see their journey unfold, to see you jump on board to this project. I mean, that's an astounding story when you really think about it. You go down to Chautauqua, you have all these big people in the FI community on board to be on a documentary and then fate intervenes and you put the project down. And then again, fate intervenes and you hear about another FI documentary on our podcast. And instead of doing what many people would do in, in different worlds, different subcultures and be kind of bitter and pissed off and, oh, he stole my idea. It was, hey, I'm going to call him up and let's chat about it. And now you guys are working on this together to bring it to fruition. And like Jonathan and I have said, this is the single most exciting thing going on in the FI community in 2018. And I know I speak for Jonathan and everyone out there, like we want to help. We would love to help in any way possible. So please know you have many tens of thousands of people looking to make this a success. Well, I thank you very much for that. And uh, we will reach out for help. We're gonna be launching a, an Indiegogo campaign to do some fundraising later in the year. We do have our seed money, which is excellent. But as I said, making a documentary is rather expensive. So just getting it finished and out there, you know, is going to take a little bit of extra help. So we'll be back. Okay, man. <laughs> you know what? I love this, Travis. And what I love about the community is how passionate we are to see you guys succeed. Like Brad just talked about, you know, there's over a hundred local groups all around the world. 
at this point, and there will be more by the time that this documentary is released, I have a feeling that we're going to be begging you, please let us do a screening in these local areas. And Brad, maybe me and you can even make it to a few of those to help, you know, set that up. It just, it's going to be so much fun to see the community celebrate this, which really is the culmination of how far this community has come, not over the last year, but over the last five to 10 years. I mean, it's just, it's just incredible. And Travis, for you, the fact that Chautauqua was really where this thing broke wide open for you, uh, Brad and I are actually going to be speaking at the Chautauqua in Thessalonica, Greece in October. Maybe if you get enough of this together, we could even do a sneak peek there and take a look at what you guys have put together. That would be awesome. Yes. I knew I could lock it down, Brad. <laughs> yeah, very good job. I was, I was very, very leery of where you're coming from. <laughs> All right, guys. Hey, Travis, before we let you go, we want to give you a chance to tackle the hot seat. Are you ready for this? I am so ready. In a world drowning in debt and rampant consumption, trapped by the chains of lifestyle inflation, These questions highlight the secrets of those who have broken free. Welcome to the Choose FI Hot Seat. Question number one, your favorite blog that's not your own. Uh, Well, I don't have a blog personally. You mean my favorite financial blog? I don't care what, yeah, you have total license here, man. This is your chance at the hot seat, your favorite blog of all time. I'm going to have to say Eater because I travel a lot and I love food and I just, I source it all the time. Financial blog, my favorite is Rockstar Finance and that's because it's an aggregator. So it points me to a lot of new stuff. So what is Eater? Is it like a recipe blog or it helps you find, tell me more about that. So one of the best jobs I ever had in my life was I spent four years being flown around the world business class to investigate the world's best restaurants, purveyors, uh, chefs. It was incredible. It was basically a precursor to the chef's table on Netflix. Eater is a blog for foodies, for people who love food. So they, they curate a list of the top 38 restaurants in every major city in the world. And every time I travel around, I go to eater and I try to hit one of the amazing restaurants that they feature. They also have recipes and stuff like that, but it's basically a blog for foodies. Nice. I, uh, my wife actually made for the first time de croix. Have you ever heard of de croix before Travis? No. What is it? <laughs> Where are you going with this? Are you sure you're pronouncing it correctly? Probably what not. is that? <laughs> Probably not. But as a foodie, I think you would get a big kick out of it. I'll shoot you an email and spell it out. I'll put it in the show notes. But she did an awesome job and it took her six hours. So it definitely qualifies as a mention on the show. Question number two, your favorite article of all time. Favorite article of all time. Well, I have to say that the shockingly simple math to early retirement is my favorite financial article of all time. I mean, that's the one that really just put it all together for me. I am convinced that every time that we do this show and we've aired the hot seat, there is somebody listening for the first time that has never heard of the Vi community. And for that single person, you should go check out the shockingly simple math of early retirement. It will change your life. (laughs) All right, Travis, question number three, your favorite life hack. (laughs) <laughs> okay, um, this is going to sound very Hollywood, but my favorite life hack is yoga. And that's because above all else, health is the most valuable resource that we have. And I have found as I've gone through my life that yoga is probably the single best form of physical maintenance that I've ever encountered. It's also a great healing, healing practice if you've had injuries and like to be athletic and stuff. Yeah, Travis, I'm with you, and that does not sound too Hollywood or you know too L.A. or whatever. I do yoga pretty much every single day. I found a a really great short five to ten minute video on a website actually called SealFit.com. So it's a okay. Navy SEAL commander. Uh, so SealFit.com/yoga. And for anybody that wants to check it out, it's uh, I I think it's helped me get into the best shape of my entire life. Just this doing this one five minute video every single day, basically. Don't you think? I mean, you know, you look around and people are like, I'm doing CrossFit and whatever. And I mean, I I just turned 50 and I'm in pretty good shape. I still run around the wilderness of Alaska, you know, with cameras and stuff occasionally. And I have to say that yoga has kept me in, I think, the best shape of my life. And it's something that I can continue to do 
for the rest of my life. I have a woman in my uh, yoga studio that I go to who's 98 years old, and she still does handstands. Oh, my goodness. Wow. That's amazing. Yeah. I need to rethink my I'm, life I'm choices. I'm nowhere near that. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, when I see her doing handstands, that blows my mind. That's where I want to go, you know? That's awesome. Yeah, no doubt about it. Because if you don't have your health, what's all this for? Yeah, I mean, just simple things. Like they say, I, th- I think I read something to the effect of people in Japan don't have the hip injuries that many people in America have in old age because – they're so used to literally getting off the floor and standing up just from where they sit and eat meals and such. And it sounds like such a little thing, but think about how few American adults in their 60s, 70s and beyond literally don't ever get on the floor and get up. And it sounds, like I said, like a very simple thing, but when you're training your body through yoga, through flexibility and mobility to do these things on a daily basis, you're just, you're extending your health span so significantly. And so I'm totally with you on this. Yeah. All right. Question number four, your biggest financial mistake. Oh, geez. (laughs) There've been so many. Okay. I'm going to do a little silver lining here. My biggest financial mistake was that early on in my financial education, I read the richest man in Babylon where he says that you're supposed to save 10% of your income, right? You're supposed to pay yourself first and save 10%. When I first started making more money than I needed, which again was like I was already in my mid-30s, I was making, I remember, $700 a week as an AP, an associate producer on a TV show. And I got a $200 a week raise when we got a new series. And I mistakenly thought that I was supposed to pay myself 10% of the raise So I paid myself $20 out of the $200 raise, and I saved the other $180. And that mistake actually is what accelerated my savings rate to create a state of financial independence for myself in less than 10 years, because I mistakenly thought that I was supposed to save 90% of my income. Does that make sense? (laughs) Travis, that that is unbelievable. So you're saying for that raise and every future raise, you got it backwards, right? Like you, essentially this was the greatest exactly. like mistake of all time. Yeah. This is a, this is a mistake for somebody who doesn't understand basic math. <laughs> <laughs> so you right? save 90% of all future raises just because you got the math backwards. Yeah. But it worked because psychologically <laughs> every time I got a raise and of course, you know, because I went from like making like nothing to having like a pretty robust career in television Every time I got a raise, I gave myself a 10% raise off of the raise. And it felt great because I was like, ooh, you know, I got an extra hundred bucks a month right now. Or, you know, in in later years, I I ended up having a few hundred extra dollars a month. And it seemed so amazing because I was so used to being so broke as an aspiring actor, basically. I love it. Um, So, yeah, um, that it took me a couple of years before I realized that I had gotten that backwards. But I never stopped after I figured it out because it was I was getting rich <laughs> and still experiencing some needed lifestyle inflation. Right. In a kind of tongue in cheek manner, you're getting 10 percent raise every single year, which is pre- pretty cool. But yet you're pretty rapidly like you're kind of alluding to there. You're rapidly approaching an overall savings rate of 90 percent. Right. Because your your starting amount was pretty small. So, yeah, I mean, your savings rate had to have been well over 80 percent or is currently. Right. Uh, Yeah, it was. It was definitely over 80 percent at the height. I've allowed myself a little lifestyle inflation since because I wasn't raised, you know, to be a frugal person. I always wanted like nice stuff. But I will tell you this, that Honda Civic that I inherited from my dad 10 years ago, I still drive it. It's a 2005 Honda Civic. Even though I could afford it, I never bought another car because I guess in the spirit of frugality and, and wanting my freedom more than a Lexus, I kept it. You have found your tribe, my friend. <laughs> well, question. You guys would be so proud. I am. Uh, whenever I, you know, LA is a place that is notorious for nice cars. And I happen to also drive around places like big agencies, like creative artists agency, where you have to valet park. And whenever I drive up to the valets at like, creative artist agencies, inevitably they sort of turn their their nose up at me because they're like, oh, here comes this joker in a Honda Civic, you know, with 
2,500. No, little do they know I'm an executive at a big media <laughs> company. And everything. Right. But they sort of, You're... they always turn their nose up at me. And then when I come back to collect my car, almost every time they get out of the car and usually they're like Mexican Americans because that's the working class of Los Angeles. And they look at me and they go, can I buy your car? Do you want to sell your car? And I'm like, no, man, this is a great car. They're like, that's a great car. It's in great shape. And I'm like, yeah, it's awesome. <laughs> I love the badge of honor with the older cars. I think it's so empowering that our community does highlight the value of older and gently used cars. And the fact that someone, instead of turning your nose up when someone drives up to your meetup with a car with 300,000 miles on it, we're all piling around, you know, giving you that badge of honor. Like, wow, I hope one day my car can make it to 300,000 miles. It's just, it's just a remarkable, weird, contrarian tribe to be a part of. All right. Question number five. So this is actually going to be a very interesting question. Uh, the advice you would give your younger self. Okay. The advice that I would give my, my younger self is probably just not to have been so hard on myself. I've always been a pretty ambitious person and I was quite hard on myself. And I don't think that I really trusted, you know, life has a funny way of helping you kind of like the way that I came across Scott through your podcast there's a lot of help along the way that we get from our friends and our community and our loved ones that we don't necessarily realize is happening, but that's a great source of power in our lives. And I think that I always thought that I needed to go it alone. Um, and it took me a long time to figure out that that's not really necessarily true. I don't know. You know, I see a lot of younger people who are similar to the way I was, which is very, very hard on themselves. Like they have to figure everything out yesterday. And that takes away from a lot of the pleasure of the unknown and the excitement and the adventure of life. I guess the way that I would sum it up, and it sounds kind of like a, it sounds like I'm giving somebody an emotional cue, but it's good to be bold in your life. It's easy to look at the future and look at the complexity and the long path that's ahead and be fearful um, and sort of worried about that. But it's okay to let go of that and just sort of act boldly as if things are going to work out because generally speaking, they do. So we're frugalists and you just confessed how you mathematically got yourself to an 80% plus savings rate. So our bonus question is, what is your favorite purchase that you made last year? Uh, and we typically go off of Amazon, but if you got it from somewhere else and that's fine too. <laughs> okay. Even though I've been very careful with the way that I spend my money. I also believe in buying really great tools. And because I love to cook, my favorite thing that I bought last year was an all clad copper core pan. It was a 10 inch frying pan. And I think it was like 180 bucks. I got it on sale. It sounds crazy to buy a frying pan that costs that much money. But if you like to cook, it absolutely transformed my abilities in the kitchen, I have to say. Dude, it's such a good pan and it's my personal go-to favorite. Uh, I don't think I have the copper core. I think mine's just like a tri-ply version. I think the copper core is one they came out with more recently. But yeah, you can find them used on eBay and you can pick them up for a little bit less. All right, man. Hey, well, thanks so much for coming on the show. This has been a lot of fun. And to our community, thank you so much for listening. If you got value from the episode, if you're enjoying listening to the show, just take one second and press the subscribe button on the platform that you're listening to this on. It just lets your player of choice know that you get value from the show and you want to be here when we produce additional content. Thank you for being a part of our community. If you want to support us, here are four easy ways. One, leave us an iTunes review. If you want to do that, just go to chooseify.com slash iTunes. Two, use our page to sign up for travel credit cards. If you want to travel the world with miles and points instead of your hard-earned dollars, then just go to chooseify.com slash cards and get started today. Three, if you're working on the milestones of FI, set up a personal capital account to track your progress and use our affiliate link. It's completely free and just go to chooseFI.com slash PC. P as in Paul, C as in Cat. And four, and most importantly, find your friends, coworkers, and family members who might be open to this message and tell them about the podcast. Have them start with episode 38, The Why of FI, and right behind that, have them go listen to episode 21, The Pillars of FI. It is a fantastic starting place. All right, my friends, the fire is spreading. We'll see you next time as we continue to go down the road less traveled. You've been listening to Choose FI Radio Podcast, where we help middle-class America build wealth one life hack at a time. <laughs>